Thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, we're super excited to kind of like run through basically, you know, what is virtual production? We're gonna kind of help define it, you know, why we're bringing it here to South Carolina. It's obviously been around for a few years now, right? Uh, but this is an emerging tech that's, you know, really kind of changing a lot in the industry in a, in a really good way and opening a lot of opportunities. So we're gonna be going through a presentation here um, to kind of define that and help really get you guys familiar with not just what it is, but like the lingo behind it, the technology behind it, and how it all works together, and you know why we do certain things certain ways, because it's a whole new way to approach production, right? Like this is a whole different way, and you'll see what I mean by that, especially after um, we're gonna do a 15 minute Q&A at the end of the presentation, so any questions you have, please you know, make note of it on your phone, wherever you need to, and then just save it for that Q&A at the end. Uh, then we're gonna be taking a little 15 minute break and uh, during that time, we're gonna be kind of resetting in here for a live demonstration. So we're actually gonna be projecting things on the wall, uh, scenes on the wall in Unreal Engine with full camera tracking. And it's gonna be very interactive, very hands-on. And that's the best way to like really understand how it all works is just seeing it in action and getting just hands-on with it. And so I think that's where a lot of things will click. So uh, during that 15 minute break, we'll also be giving a tour of the studio for anyone who wants to see the rest of the facility, those uh, other studios that Will mentioned. Um, yeah. And then the rest of the afternoon will be really, really saved uh, for that demo. So without further ado, we can get uh, right into it. Um, so let's talk about you know, the birth of virtual production, right? So virtual production technically has been around a really long time because it's a very, very broad term, right? Virtual production these days, most people think of like the Mandalorian, right? Well, that's a branch of virtual production called in-camera visual effects, ICVFX for short, uh, but really, Virtual production has been around uh, a lot longer than that. It's become a much bigger buzzword over the last few years because of shows like The Mandalorian. Uh, but I want to look at, at the past century, like some of the uh, the innovations that took place in the world of you know filmmaking that kind of led to where we are now. Uh, so one of those is actually rear projection. So this goes all the way back to uh, you know the old days of cinema. This is obviously from the 60s for a James Bond film with Sean Connery. Rear projection actually goes all the way back to the 1930s. Literally, it's the simple art of using a projector and a screen put behind your actor. It was great for driving plate shots. You see it all over the place. And it was used for decades, all the way up to the 90s. Even films like Terminator 2, Judgment Day, uh, used it for a handful of scenes where the actors had to be in very dangerous situations, but they wanted it to actually be Arnold Schwarzenegger and the kid actor. They used virtual uh, uh, rear projection a lot in that movie, and I never knew that for the longest time. Um, so yeah, that was like one of the first times they started to really utilize uh, the the you know virtual production is the melding of virtual and physical assets together. In this case, it was not virtual uh, projection; it was actually projecting real footage, but it's the same principle of kind of melting those together. And that was before computers, you know, modern computers really existed. So that was the way they approached that. You know, fast forward a little bit, then you've got green screen technology, right? And so green screen is everywhere now. It's, it's pretty much, it's still the dominant force for what you could consider a type of, of virtual production, right? And these days, you know, green screen goes all the way back to uh, actually like the 1920s, technically, when they were using a chemical process to use green and blue screens and even what we call mats using black uh, to actually like take two images on film and use a, uh, a chemical process to then reveal it and make it look like they're actually on top of each other. This was used back in like uh, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton days. And so then fast forward when modern computers came on the scene, like the 70s and 80s, you started to see more of an adoption where they developed software that could go in and do the process of chroma keying, which is literally, you know, being able to take a green source or a blue source, remove it out of the scene, right? So green screen has been around uh, a long time and um, it's still probably the dominant thing you see on all Hollywood movies, TV shows. Um, you know, pretty much any size budget can can do green screen, and that has been the the you know, the standard for so long that it's kind of got everyone thinking of a certain kind of order of operations when it comes to production, where a lot of those decisions when it comes to green screen could be made in post, right? You could wait till you get in the editing room to really start making some decisions like, all right, let's figure out how this looks. Now that's not best practice. If you have talked to any visual effects supervisor, they'll tell you, no, we need to have that planned out ahead of time so we know how to light on set. Oh, there's all these factors to make it look good. And we've all seen bad green screen, 
I'm sure we've seen more bad green screen than good green screen, right? And it's one of those things that takes you out of a movie. It takes you out of the moment. You might not even know why it looks fake, right? It's that kind of uncanny factor. And this happens all the time in movies. Think about digital uh, restoration or uh, uh, what's that called? Uh, where they youth, uh, de-age, de-aging, right? Think about all the de-aging we've seen over the years of making older people look younger in movies. And you're like, that doesn't look right. That just looks weird. And it's uh, you know kind of strange to look at. And sometimes you don't know why it looks off to you, but you just know on a subconscious level. And the reason for that is because, you know, think about de-aging. We look at faces every day. You're studying faces on a subconscious level. You don't really realize it. But when you see a face that's not real, you instantly can tell because like, of all these little things. Like if they were doing mocap, right? You think of a fully digital human and mouths are the hardest thing to mocap uh, these days. Like literally the lips are like, have some of the most intricate muscles and the way they form and doing what we call blend shapes in uh, 3D are very difficult. And it wasn't until like the most recent Avatar, Avatar has just some of the most ridiculous special effects. I'm sure we all know that. And they've helped push a lot of the technology that's used in virtual production forward. Uh, and it wasn't until the most recent one, Way of Water, that used some of the most advanced facial uh, capture software and uh, hardware we've seen to where it finally looks like pretty daggum real and it's really hard to tell the difference these days. But yeah, so green screen and a lot of that tech has been dominant. And uh, nowadays, uh, we're starting to shift, uh, see a shift towards uh, in-camera VFX. So obviously, this came on the scene uh, in its modern form in uh, 2019 when Mandalorian came out, which was the actual projection of uh, virtual worlds in camera uh, behind your subjects. Now, we actually already saw this uh, well before the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian is really just the one who figured out the workflow and how to introduce something like Unreal Engine, which is literally a video game software, but they could they found a way to put all these pieces of hardware, which we're going to go over all the hardware in this room today to help you understand it, but they're the ones who figured it out. Literally, ILM and uh, Disney, they, they put it together. It, it's kind of funny. Season one of Mandalorian was a real rocky production when it came to being the first one to modernize in-camera VFX. Most of the stuff, I've heard horror stories, but most of the shots that they did do in camera VFX where they were projecting in needed rotoscoping. They had to go in and fix stuff and then it kind of defeated the purpose. They still got there and they, they perfected it in seasons two and three, but season one was kind of a rocky start because they were the ones who were trailblazing. They were the ones pioneering. But really, if you, fa uh, if you actually rewind a few years before Mandalorian, uh, how many ever saw the movie Oblivion with Tom Cruise, right? So a handful of us, basically uh, there was a, a big setting in that movie was up in the clouds, like this really high uh, floating like station up in the clouds. And for that movie, they actually used a form of front projection on giant screens. And it was actually projectors projecting this uh, basically 360 panorama of a cloud environment. And it actually looked really good. You know, to, to the movie's credit, it's an okay movie. But the effects itself were uh, actually pretty amazing and the fact that they were doing it all in camera. So that was another form of, of virtual production. It just, it didn't have any of the bells and whistles like the tracked cameras and things like that and using Unreal Engine, they were actually using a lot of like plate projection and things like that, which is literally taking real world elements and projecting those. So yeah, in-camera VFX has come onto the scene. Um, uh, for the last three years, and it's starting to get more and more adopted in a lot of different ways. And that's something I want to kind of look at today is the ways you can use it. It's not just, uh, you know, exclusive to big Hollywood productions. Early on, it definitely was, but now it's getting way more approachable. It's getting way more at the, the, the barrier for entry is getting lower, right? And that's one of the big reasons we wanted to bring it to the upstate. We wanted to make this tech available because right now the closest one you'll find is Atlanta, right? And, and there's, so there's a handful of in Atlanta. There's plenty on the West Coast. And the crazy thing is about those ones on the West Coast, those are the ones that are literally the size of airplane hangers and they're meant for like blockbuster, the next DC or Marvel film. They're the only people who can really afford those because they're like $50,000 a day to rent with, for just a wall. It's a, it's a shell and a wall. And that's all you're getting. You have to find the people to run the wall. You have to, it's all these things. And so luckily now 
bringing this over here, we've been able to uh, you know, make it way more approachable and show people how it doesn't have to just be reserved for big blockbuster applications or you know, narrative, even narrative work. You can use it in a wide variety of, of mediums, right? You can use it on documentary, you can use it on commercial work, you can use it in product work, you can use it on talking heads. And there's all these different ways you can approach it that doesn't always need fully tracked cameras and fully uh, 3D worlds that are projected, right? There's so many different ways you can go about it. And that's kind of our job here at Pronk is kind of to know what's the best way to approach it and to make those kinds of recommendations. And I'll tell you right now, there's times we people approach us about it and we're like, you know what? The LED wall is not the way to go. And we're going to be very upfront with that. And, and that's actually one of the slides we're going to get into. We, uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of ICV effects and we're going to talk about the limitations, right? We're not here to tell you it's, it's the Swiss army knife because it's not. You know, it's definitely got the things you have to keep in mind, right? You know, before you approach your production. So now I'm going to kind of move into uh, the tech, right? So we have our technology here, and uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to kind of be defining a lot of things. Uh, mainly, uh, I want to define, you know, obviously the word virtual production, but there is some lingo you're going to hear. If you're ever on a, on a set with an LED wall, these are a lot of terms you're going to hear, and we're going to basically kind of break those down for you. But virtual production, like I said earlier, is literally... Uh, media that merges virtual and physical elements together, right, in camera or, you know, it could be done in post as well, like we were talking about with green screen and things like that. So this applies to motion capture, camera tracking, set extensions. There is software now where you are not limited to the width of your LED wall. You can do actual extensions in camera. You don't have to wait till you get into post where it can actually extend the virtual world past the edge of your LED wall. It's the same kind of technology you're seeing being used. Um, think about any kind of like really high-end news broadcast where they're like showing things being projected in the environment that are like graphs coming out of the ground and floating in the air. And as the camera moves, it actually tracks really well. If anyone's seen Fox Sports uh, Sunday, that really high-tech set that they're on um, with uh, Terry Bradshaw and all those guys, that is a full-blown LED wall, like virtual production set they built, and they're using things like Unreal Engine to project all around them, even the floor is an LED uh, surface, technically. So it's a, it's a whole thing they're using it for. So a lot of different ways you can, uh, you can use it and approach it. So first uh, piece of lingo that I wanna kind of break down for y'all is ICVFX. Obviously, uh, like I said, it's in-camera visual effects, and that just is what we typically are doing here at Pronk Studios. It is when you are using an LED wall to project something that is seen in camera behind your subject. And the subject can be a person, it can be a product, it can be whatever you want it to be. And then you uh, have a lot of factors that have to be figured out. You've got perspective, you've got the pixel pitch of the wall, which is one of those things I'm about to uh, break down what that is. Uh, there's all these things like viewing angles and everything that um, comes into play for how to make it look correct. Because a lot of the time, you know, we found that no matter how much math we do, however many measurements we do, sometimes when we get the camera up and we look at the monitor, sometimes it just doesn't look right. And that's when those little manual adjustments come to play too. And it's kind of fun because then you're like, you know, you know what, this looks too perfect. You know, we need to actually, we need to rotate our world. We actually need to move the sun and the amount of customization you have, you guys will see in our tech demo later. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, the things we say on set, a lot of the times when like when Will literally tells me to like, hey, can you take that mountain and move it up to block more of the sunlight coming in? Things you never say before, you know, ICV effects. Uh, but it's really cool that we have the ability to do that in real time. There have been times when we need to relight a scene and it was as simple as literally moving some lights into a scene, retexturing some things. Oh, change that wallpaper to be blue instead of red. And the client's like, yep, that's it. And those are things that would take hours right, to do on a real physical set if, if you show up on set and they're trying to make last minute changes. So the flexibility that in-camera VFX uh, gives you is pretty amazing. And so a lot of that is made possible by the brain bar. So brain bar is literally that row of computers back there. So there's three desks back there where Johnny's sitting. And uh, basically those three computers are all working together on a local network. There's a server rack sitting next to it that has a whole bunch of tech inside of it. But basically, Starting on the far right, there's a computer that is simply dedicated to tracking. Its job is to receive the information from these blue cameras up here. There's 12 OptiTrack uh, cameras up top here. 
And those are all running into a Netgear switch behind our wall that's running up over the uh, ceiling, back down that channel, and into that computer so that all 12 of those cameras are being fed through that switch into that uh, computer through a software that that manufacturer uses to then literally map out our studio. If we can show you on that screen later on, there's a literal 3D representation of this room on that computer. And it has those, the exact distance they are from the, the floor and everything, they're laid out in an array. And so that helps us know distance, it helps us measure, and it also helps us track our camera on set. We'll be showing that off later, but basically wherever our camera goes, it has a piece that sits on top of it, right? And it's uh, what we call the mine, and uh, we'll define what that is, uh, M-I-N-E. And basically it's, it's the piece that has these five IR spheres, and it's tracked by those cameras, right? And so that then helps translate into the next computer, which is the middle computer that has Unreal Engine running on it. So Unreal Engine, for anyone who's not familiar, is a video game software. It's literally meant for making video games, and they found a way to create very photo real uh, environments that can be then translated onto or projected onto an LED wall, and it looks insane. It's amazing. And the big innovation that came with Unreal Engine was the, able, the ability to do real-time rendering. Because up until the last decade, it was near impossible to do real-time rendering of 3D environments. Uh, and that's just because of a lot of factors. That was a lot of factors in tech, like computer hardware having to catch up, software having to catch up. Unreal Engine, that's one of its big things that it, uh, that it advertises, is the ability to do real-time rendering. You can, because you're seeing, think about it, your camera, we're shooting in 24 frames per second on a typical set, right? Sometimes you're shooting 30, sometimes you're shooting 60, but we're typically shooting in 24 frames per second. So if we want to project something on the wall, we not only need to be able to project the scene, it needs to be able to run like a video game at at least 24 frames per second. You definitely want higher than that just for stability, not dropping frames or anything. But 10 years ago, that was pretty much impossible um, unless you just had the most powerful render farm in the world, um, which was just a network of computers all dedicated to just rendering an image. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing how far we've come. One single computer can now, with a single graphics card, can render it all in real time, and it looks amazing, and you have full control of everything. And then that Unreal Engine machine, it's obviously running the scene. That is then sending, once you're done and you're ready to project on your wall, it is sending a signal to that far left computer, which is actually, the monitors are on the desk, the computer itself is actually horizontal inside of that uh, server rack, it's at the bottom, and that is what we call our render node, which is the next one on our list here. And render node is literally a dedicated computer uh, for rendering the image. It's actually, because you want a dedicated computer for loading the editor, which is the program for like running Unreal, making your ch uh, changes in real time. That's where you'd be making, change the wall color paper, let's change the temperature of that light in the virtual world. But that left computer, its only job is to literally render the scene to the wall. And so that render node is running via into a what we call a processor um, by, Br by Brompton. They're kind of like one of the leading industry standards for uh, an LED image processor. And those processors are sending their image via optical fiber cables up that back white channel along the back wall that's going over our ceiling to back behind. There's these things called distribution units. And those distribution units, their job is to literally take an image there's uh, a few of them back there. They're all mapped together. And their job is to take one image and span it across 220 LED tiles. That's how many we have. They're all daisy chained together, right? And so they're basically 220 small TVs, literally. They're independent sources. And so those are all mapped in a software on the render node as well uh, to know how the tiles are laid out. They actually have to go in and specifically lay them out the way that they are connected. There's a whole lot of hardware we'll show y'all when we do the tour later. A lot of daisy chaining and cables all running together in a very specific way. If one of those cables gets moved or removed, things start to break. It's because it's all mapped out in the computer. And so those distribu distribution units are very, very important uh, because that's what gets you a cohesive single image. Otherwise, it'll just look It'll look wrong, It'll look off, right? And so, yeah, now you've got your image on the wall, right? We've gotten all the way through the brain bar, we've projected to our wall, and I want you to imagine, you see how we've got our presentation li lined out here. Um, I want you to imagine that is our frustum. 
So this is a really big word that's come on the scene uh, because of ICV effects. And literally a frustum is what is, uh, an inner frustum to be specific, is what is seen in camera. And y'all will see this later. Uh, whenever we're aiming our camera at the wall, you will see one image that moves around with the camera and the rest of the wall is called the outer frustum, which is technically frozen. It's just there to give you light. So what we do is say there's a warehouse back there that you're looking at. And wherever I move the camera, this box moves wherever I move. But everything outside of it doesn't really need to be taking up rendering power. That's just gonna bog us down. So what we do, we freeze the outer frustum. And so then it's really just a still image that's out there. But the reason you do that is so you're still getting light. Because you, the, the, the LED wall is a source. It's a light source in your scene now. And that's one of the big things we have to kind of reapproach lighting, which Will Stewart, he's really gonna be breaking it down for you guys uh, today of, of how we approach a scene and how to light it. Because this is a source now. Like this is like your world. It's like you just showed up in this room. Those are sources of light, right? Those are kind of our motivated lighting if this were a, a set, right? So yeah, so that's kind of an, uh, a definition of what a frustum looks like. And y'all see that here later on. And uh, now you've got it on the wall. Now the, there's a lot of uh, talk about pixel pitch and pixel pitch is basically how fine your pixels are. It's literally uh, the distance between pixels in millimeters. Pitch affects moray and optimal viewing distance between the camera and the LED wall. And so every manufacturer has kind of a calculator for how you can figure this out. We know with our wall, the optimal viewing distance of the camera, where the camera should be for best viewing. It is not the law, you can get closer with the camera, but this is where they recommend. Uh, it's 25 feet away. Now you, you're so you come out here, that green dot right there, 25 feet. And so that's where we know, that's just our general reference of, okay, this is like optimal viewing. We've gotten much closer than that and you can still have great results. Closer you get though, the more out of focus you need to make your wall because your wall cannot be in focus. And that's gonna, I'm gonna save that for the limitations side, right? Because that's a, that's a factor. You know, if you've ever, you know, focused to a screen, it looks nuts, right? You just, you see a bunch of pixels and it just looks horrible, right? Same thing applies, because this is like, this is mini LED technology, what we call it. And um, so that's the thing we have to kind of always keep in mind is knowing our distance to the wall and making sure that we're not catching any kind of moray, any kind of scan lines, anything like that. Um, and so that is where pixel pitch uh, plays a, a big part. Pixel pitches are, have a wide range too. So you'll see the finest pixel pitches I've seen are 1.5 millimeter. Ours is 2.3. I've seen them go all the way up to like three or four millimeters. And really 2.3, uh, the 1.5 to 2.8, 2.8 is kind of the best range I've seen for when it's actually being seen in camera. There are other times you'll see on uh, different uh, stages where they actually have secondary LED walls, right? And those secondary LED walls, they could be just a little four by four array. They're like 10 by 10 uh, array. It's just a free floating wall they could bring in for car driving shots. And that way it's catching reflections on the windshield or the glass and they could put it anywhere. They even have ceilings that then can be hung overhead and they could project the sky or the trees above and then you're getting realistic color and lighting data on your actor. And so you'll see uh, stages out there that do complete 180 degree uh, curve, or sorry, 360 degree curves around your, your subject. And it's amazing because you're just getting light from every single direction and then it makes it even easier to light it because they're already looking, just, just with the wall alone on those setups, it already looks amazing. And so, Pixel pitch on those external sources that aren't being seen in camera, those are the ones that are typically three millimeter, four millimeter, because the, the wider, the, the more distance between your pixels, right? Think about like a scoreboard. If you've ever seen, like you can actually like really see the individual LEDs if you've ever looked at one of those in a sports arena. And that's because they don't need, you know, if you're farther away from them, they look fine. You'd never notice it. But if you've ever walked by them as you're leaving the arena, you'll see like you can, they're like the size of a golf ball, right? Each individual pixel. So that's because distance is a factor, right? And so we know our optimal distance uh, with a 2.3 pixel pitch. And the last one I want to kind of introduce you guys to uh, is VAD, V-A-D. And that is the virtual art department. This is a whole new kind of department that has come on the scene as a result of virtual production, right? And 
This can be everything from what we call a virtual gaffer, whose job is literally to sit at the computer on the Unreal Engine and to light the scene, help with actually approaching it from a real world lighting uh, approach, right? Because we can actually go in, we have control over the cone of light, the intensity of that light, the temperature of the light, all these factors that you would have control over in the real world. And a experienced gaffer, DP, they're gonna be making those requests like, oh, hey, can we actually, you know, adjust the color temperature of that or whatever. And so having a virtual gaffer is someone who understands not only real world lighting, but knows how to do it inside of Unreal Engine. That's a very valuable role because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there who understand real world lighting, but it's a whole nother thing to understand how it translates into 3D. That's a whole nother thing. Uh, another person on virtual art department is just, just any kind of designer who's involved in the actual process of creating the virtual world because Nowadays, pre-production has gotten so important. Remember earlier we talked about how green screen kind of let people like, oh, we can just save it for post, right? We'll, we'll worry about that later. And that happens so often, especially on the Marvel movies and all those where it's like time crunch, budget crunch, whatever it is. And like, ah, we'll figure it out later. Let's just, let's light it, let's do it. Let's leave it up to the people who's like, there's like 200 people at the very end of the movie in the credits, right? Let's leave it up to those 200 visual effects artists. They're not overworked. No, not at all. So yeah, nowadays with in-camera VFX, you have to have all that figured out ahead of time. And so that's where virtual art department really comes into play because they're brought in early on. They're a part of discovery meetings. They're a part of, of literally pre meetings and figuring out, okay, what are we shooting? How does it look? Let's start mocking it up. Let's get approvals on like the look. Let's put together mood boards. Let's put together like kind of like our vision. And then they start executing it. And they've got all kinds of people that are helping with that. They've got modelers, they've got designers, they've got people who do texturing, like creating all this stuff. And so your virtual art department is pretty daggum important when it comes to just achieving the look of your virtual world on set. And they're gonna be on set too, a lot of the time on like those kinds of productions where you might need to make changes to the actual design it's not so much like, oh, I want to change the lighting. No, I want to go steampunk, right? Now we got to go a whole other direction in terms of art direction, right? And now we got to start rethinking this. Uh, that's a very extreme example, but that's why they're there. They're there to help know how to reapproach a design, how to implement those things in the virtual world. Uh, so virtual art department has gotten really, really important uh, over really the last two years. They've become more and more uh, uh, prominent on film sets that are doing on an LED wall. So that's it for kind of defining virtual production. Uh, now we'll kind of move into a uh, tech overview, which we've kind of got introduced you guys to a lot of these things, but now we're going to get a little more technical, right? So first we'll start with our LED tiles, right? So this is what the backside of the LED tiles look like. And we'll, we'll give you guys uh, a close look at that during our tour. But you can see uh, on one side, you've got data cables and they're daisy chaining from one to the other. So one connects to the next one, one connects to the next one, and they go up. Other side is power cables. And so those are all daisy chaining together, and if one goes out, the rest of that column goes out. And then you just gotta figure out which one it is, is the culprit, which is usually the one at the bottom. And you just swap out the cable, swap out the backpack. There's, all, there's very, very modular, the LED tiles. And that's kind of the, the really great thing about um, LED walls, is how it's literally like Legos. Like literally you can configure them any way you want. They're very easy to troubleshoot and maintain. Uh, we're getting ready here in the next uh, couple months. Right, right now we are 20 tiles uh, across and 11 tiles uh, going down, right? That's 220 tiles total. We're actually getting ready because uh, we found that the height of our wall isn't always really being utilized for what we're using it for. So what we're doing, we're actually gonna be taking off the top two rows. That's gonna give us 40 tiles. We're actually ex just extending it on the, on the side. And so that's actually gonna give us, right now we are 33 foot wide, 18 foot tall. That's gonna give us 40 foot wide, 15 foot tall. And so now, and, and it's, it's, it can be done in a day. It's, a, it's amazing. And the other part of what we're doing, uh, this is a default configuration you can see at the bottom of the LED wall. That is your standard truss that comes with a, from, from any manufacturer. It's about a six inch, uh, gap from the floor, which obviously that could be a factor, right? When you're shooting, because if you need to get a wide shot, we don't want to see that. We need, we need to be able to, you know, melt the two worlds together, which you could build a stage, you could raise the floor, you could build a physical surface that then gets extended into the world. But what we're doing is we're actually going to lower it to where it's one inch off the ground, making it even easier to build surfaces that can be extended virtually. 
in the world. So it's pretty amazing how the, the tech all works together. It's super modular. They, we, we literally constructed this in like a 24 hour period, which is pretty amazing. And it's a free standing structure, literally. So once we go back there and we show you, you'll see there's literally sandbags on the trusses. There's, there's ratchet straps that just keep it held in place so it doesn't go anywhere. But it literally can be moved anywhere. And, they, and that's what they do a lot of times for uh, events. Think about any concert you've been to these days. A lot of big concerts are using this, you know, these LED walls. Even churches have them these days. So, I mean, they're popping up everywhere and they're very, very modular. And so the next uh, piece of tech that we kind of mentioned was the Brompton processor. And its job in over there for the render node uh, is literally to be able to take the signal. Uh, it's just coming out via HDMI. It's display port to HDMI into the processor. And that processor is taking that image of Unreal Engine, sending it back to those distribution units to help it render it to the wall. And obviously the render node gave you a, a good overview of that. Its literal job is to render it. And it's rendering Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine 5, I could do a whole presentation on why that thing is a big deal. Uh, if you've never messed around with Unreal Engine, it's free, which is, makes no sense. Uh, but thank you Fortnite for keeping it free because it's the only reason it's still free. Thank you to all the 12 year olds who buy V-Bucks and keep it free. Um, it's, it's insane, it makes no sense. And Fortnite's become a literal, you know, everyone's familiar with Fortnite, I'm sure, but Fortnite is run on Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine uses Fortnite as its testing ground. It literally implements all the new features into Fortnite and shows them off there. And so it kind of, they, they kind of go hand in hand nowadays. And Unreal Engine 5 is amazing, uh, not just because it's free, but just because of how powerful it is, how intuitive it is. If you've ever played uh, a PC game and you've done like the WASD movement, right, using a keyboard, you can do that inside the 3D uh, program, Unreal Engine. You can fly around your world just using very intuitive controls if you've ever played any video game on a PC. And just the control you have, it's, in my opinion, I've used a handful of 3D modeling softwares out there or just 3D softwares in general it's probably the easiest one to learn, and there's so much resources out there to learn it. Um, but the fact that it's come so far, just from Unreal 4 to Unreal 5, everything they've done has helped kind of pave the way for what is now possible in ICVFX. And uh, yeah, next up is our OptiTrack cameras. Uh, these guys, um, we've got them array for like, there's actually, can't really see with our teaser here, which is this curtain. We've actually got uh, four more here across the front, but we've basically created a full 360 degree array of cameras. So whenever you look on that tracking computer we were talking about, it literally has a full 360 degree view. You can actually see the rays that are being shot out by those cameras, right? So enjoy the radiation, feels great. Uh, but literally it's IR, it's infrared, right? And so those are all shooting out infrared rays that are looking for uh, basically something to reflect off of. So we've got our camera here later on. We're going to bring out what we call the mine, which is the next piece, which is that guy right there in that right photo. It's those five spheres. Those are being picked up. When you, whenever you look at the feed of the cameras, it's just black. It doesn't see anything because it's infrared. But when you bring out the mine, you then see these five spheres floating in 3D space. And those rays are catching it. And so then the reason we do a configuration like that, it looks very random and that's on purpose because that then helps it uh, figure out its pitch, yaw, and roll, which is your X, Y, and Z axes as you're moving it in any, any general direction. doesn't matter how you orient it, uh, it can pick it up and it can uh, create it correctly. And basically that's what we call a rigid body. And we do five points because to create a rigid body, you need at least three points. Three points gets you X, Y, and Z. So if you have more than three points, the more you can have for reference, the better your tracking is gonna be, right? Because then it has more reference for, oh, this is how it's tilting forward or how it's tilting backwards and going all directions. So the mine is a pretty, uh, pretty amazing piece and those go hand in hand. The mine and the OptiTrack cameras are meant to go together. They, they're, they're useless one without the other, right? So we'll be demoing these, those really uh, well later on today. Uh, and we'll give you guys kind of an overview of basically the uh, process, not just from like a shooting and lighting standpoint, but how do we approach a, uh, a, a shoot when it comes to the actual calibration process? Because there's a whole calibration process for calibrating your tracking cameras and all that stuff. So we're gonna show that to you guys later on. And so next up, we're gonna talk about the benefits of ICVFX, right? So these are kind of like uh, our, our main things that we've kind of noticed 
uh, and taken away as we started to implement it more and more in our shoots uh, for clients and things like that. Um, biggest and most uh, obvious one is you get proper reflections and lighting in camera. That's kind of one of the reasons that the Mandalorian's armor is all reflective was because of the LED wall. That actually was a factor in the costume of the Mandalorian. It's because it caught all the reflections. Their stage was a full, it wasn't a full 360, it was like a 270 degree curve, but literally you would catch reflections from no matter where he looked. And it just looks amazing and it really sells that effect. And so that's a nice thing about having uh, you know, this rear projected behind your subject. Now you're getting you know, proper spill around your subject. And like that's the hardest thing about green screen is getting it, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, like where you're trying to make it look like they actually melt into that world. There's all these factors that we don't think about in lenses and in cameras, like bloom. Like when light from a sun source is hitting a lens, it's going all over the place inside that lens and it's creating like halation, depending on the lens. It's always a factor. Uh, some are better at handling it than others, but there's halation, there's bloom. There's all these things that help it just look correct and look like it's a part of that world. And that's why, if you don't do your due diligence for a green screen shoot to know what it's gonna look like in the final product, to know how to light it on set, it ain't gonna work. You know, no, no visual effects artist can just fake, you know, proper lighting and reflections to look correct on a subject because it's all these micro details that really sell it. Another big advantage, obviously, is animated backgrounds in camera. You know, we have the ability, because of Unreal Engine, to animate any kind of world you want back there. You also, like I mentioned earlier, you can also just use plate projection, which is literally just photos and videos of real things. Put them back there. We did a test uh, with a wine bottle where it was literally just photos we projected back there. Photos of like a wine cask or a wine cellar back there. We were doing slow motion shots with some wine being poured out of a bottle. And you'd never know. You never know whatsoever. And it was all about knowing the perspective of that photo, knowing the lighting in the photo itself. We had to analyze, okay, what's the motivated lighting in this plate we're using, right? So you gotta take those into account to know how to make it work. But it's amazing that you have the ability to not just use Unreal Engine and things like that, but you could totally just use photos and videos. And it's amazing how well it works if you know how to approach it from a lighting standpoint. And Unreal Engine gives us the ability to literally put anything we want back there, right? You know, we can put, uh, you know, full 3D humans, digi doubles is what we refer to them as, right? Who are the, uh, walking around in the background. The most recent uh, Mandalorian season, season three, did this a lot. They did it a whole lot, where if you look in the background, though, all those people you see walking around back there, except for like the first couple rows of people in the foreground, they're all digital. And they're even matching the wardrobe of the digi doubles to the physical people on the set. It's amazing what you can do, and you can animate literally anything back there. You want a meteor coming out of the sky? Okay, no problem. And you can make anything happen. So rapid lighting and set changes is, uh, is another big one. Excuse me. God, I'm talking a lot. You know? um, rapid lighting and set changes. Um, this is the biggest one. Like I talked about earlier, how you can relight something instantly. You know, something that, you know, if we get in on, on the day of, now we're typically doing what we call pre-light days which are the days for the client, the DP, uh, to come in and literally put everything on the wall. Let's, let's get your first shot set up. Let's make sure everything's working right and looking correct from a vision standpoint. So doing pre-light days um, are very, very valuable, but uh, anyone who's ever been on any kind of set with a client knows that changes happen no matter how much prep there is. That's my disclaimer for the day. So no matter how much you prep, there's always gonna be changes to make. And ICVFX makes it so easy and so quick. Um, with it being real time, you can see those changes instantaneously in camera and not have to wait for you know, someone to go and repaint a wall or to move a light or get, fly in a whole new light. It's going from minutes, if not hours, of changes to seconds, right? Reduction of practical sets in terms of cost and time. Um, now, practical sets are not going anywhere. Right, practical sets are always going to serve a purpose, and really, best practice is to not just rely on just the wall. Like, put a person and the wall, and then call it a day. That's just not going to sell it, right? You still need to approach it from a physical aspect and to extend the world into the. And like, using foreground objects is the most classic uh, trick to do when shooting on an LED wall. Put as much physical elements into the scene that you can, but also keeping in mind making sure it matches 
the background. That's a whole other factor. You can't just, you can put anything you want in the foreground, but you got to make sure it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense from a scale or perspective sense? Does it make sense from a design standpoint? And like all these factors. Um, so that's been a big thing is like now that you can do set extensions, you only have to build a certain portion of your set now. You really only have to build from the wall out that part of the set. The rest of it could be just virtually projected back there. And you just cut down your actual set building in half easily. So parallax is uh, probably the biggest benefit and uh, parallax is literally just the effect you get whenever you have your camera tracked by the OptiTrack cameras, right? It is that mine is to help translate uh, perspective and the actual location of your camera. What it does, and the only way to really explain parallax is to show you all, so y'all will see it uh, like firsthand in the demo, but when you move the camera, think about distance between objects, right? Think about when you're traveling down the highway. When you're traveling down the highway, light poles are going at you like a million miles an hour, right? They're flying by you. But if you see something up in the sky, like a cloud, looks like it's sitting still, right? It's barely moving. That's because it's far away. And that's a really dramatic example of what parallax is. The more distance you have between objects, as you move left to right or whatever, they move at different speeds. And that's a big benefit you get in Unreal Engine. Because if you were to just throw up a plate, right? You know, just a photo or a video. If you move the camera, it doesn't have proper parallax because everything is already baked into that image, right? So if there's two things in your photo, right? There's like something way in the distance and something really close to camera, they're going to move at the same speed. They're just going to stay stuck together. But in reality, if you move the camera, one should be moving much faster than the other, right? So that's something we will show to you guys uh, during the demo. It's a pretty am amazing thing to see in reality because you just don't think about it. It's one of those real things you just never think about what sells the effect. Uh, and the other one is just reduced uh, post-production time. You know, now you're, you're, you're really taking a lot of time you would be spending in post, moving it into pre-production. Pre-production has become king, right? And so you really got to be sure you are prepped and ready to go. So now let's talk about uh, some of the limitations of ICVFX, right? So exterior scenes with high noon lighting are extremely difficult to emulate. And what I mean by that is I don't care what light you have. I don't care how much money you have. It is so hard to fake the sun. It is. I don't care if it's 93 whatever million miles away, that sucker's bright, and it shoots light everywhere. It's literally bouncing off every surface, and to emulate that in a studio environment is very difficult. Like, it's uh, almost near impossible. And so, if you have a scene that is outdoor with no kind of like, you know, covering overhead, you're wanting it to be like high noon, it's just, it's very difficult to make it look real. It just is, from, from a strictly lighting standpoint. And so that's one of those scenarios, be like, nope, we don't recommend, we recommend you go out in your parking lot and, you know, shoot on a green screen. Shoot with the sun above your talent on a green screen because that's going to look way better than any studio light on your subject, right? So scenes that require very fast movement and camera tracking are near, near impossible due to latency and lag. And we'll, and, uh, we'll kind of define what latency and lag are is basically where there is a very slight delay when you move the camera. It's not really noticeable in camera, but when you're on set looking at it, there might always be like a very slight delay, right? And that's just because of all of the pieces like going from that very far right computer with the tracking information, going to the next computer, going to the next one, going through the processor, going through the optical fiber, going into the distribution unit, going to the wall. Those are all bottlenecks technically, right? It's, it's creating some kind of cap where it can only transmit so much data. So you're always gonna have a latency and a lag when it comes to a uh, virtual production. It's, it's our job as the you know, brain bar team to minimize that as much as possible. And that comes into a lot of things like optimizing the, the world in Unreal Engine to render at a high frame rate, making sure nothing is really bogging us down. And there's a whole lot of things we do to make sure that happens. But let's say you want to do a whip pan, right? Because of that lag, you might see the frustum kind of isn't caught up with the camera if you move like super fast. We're talking like a breakneck speed whip pan. It just wouldn't be able to keep uh, to catch up. And that's strictly just because of the way it's uh, designed, the technology. That's on literally any stage, any set. Doesn't matter how big the stage is, how much tech they have, there's always latency and there's always lag. And that's a factor we have to keep in mind. Um, but that's if you need tracking at the same time, right? If you're doing a whip pan and you don't need tracking, it's fine. 
because you know how wide your wall is. And so you could do whip pans away from it and stuff like that if you're not having to worry about a frustum having to move with it with camera tracking. So one of the biggest things that can break the illusion is faded shadows. Uh, and this is one I'm not gonna touch too much on right now because that's one uh, that Will Stewart's really gonna kind of break down for y'all and we're gonna show off exactly what it means. But it's basically where light is spilling onto your wall and then it's raising the image, it's raising the shadows. That's why we have this, what we call a teaser, this, this curtain. It's on a motorized winch. We can actually lower it down to like about this high or so. And that's, its job is to block these lights and any lights we have overhead in the scene from spilling onto the wall, right? So that's a big factor we do, uh, or we have to kind of do is what I call a shadow check uh, when we're doing production. And uh, lastly, you know, slow motion frame rates above 60 frames per second. And what I mean by that is if you do need to shoot, um, 60 frames can be pushing it, but if you especially need to shoot like 120 frames per second, very slow motion, right? You're not going to be able to do camera tracking at the same time because now the factor is if any PC gamers here in the room, three of us, all right, awesome. Um, anyone who's gaming on PC knows that like, you know, higher frame rates always better because it leads to lower lag, lower latency, and things like that. But if you are shooting at 120 frames, we now need our scene to render an Unreal Engine at 120 frames. Technically, we want it higher, just to be on the safe side. And to render a scene at that high frame rate that is in real time, man, the amount of processing power that takes, not even Pixar has that much rendering power. And their movies take about a one to two years to render. Fun fact of the day, Pixar movies take over a year to render. So they don't get to see them for a whole long time after they finish them and they move on to the next movie. Um, and that they have like one of the biggest render farms in the world, literally. Pixar, it's, it's an amazing setup they have. And even with that, it's still almost near impossible uh, because the, the rendering power it takes to be able to render higher than 60 frames, you have to do so much optimization, optimization and pulling back in your scene, right? You have to start stripping things out to help it just run smooth. So we really, we stick to 24 frames. Uh, we can go up to 48 frames if we want. 60 would be where we would be capping it, but we would need to know that well ahead of time so that we can kind of do our own optimization ahead of time in our, in our environment, right? So that's kind of the, some of the biggest limitations you'll kind of run into with uh, in-camera VFX. So now uh, this, this is one of our last sections of the presentation here, and then we'll move into our Q&A, right? So this is a whole new way to approach production, right? Um, I already mentioned it. Pre-production is now the most important part of a project, literally. Pre-production, it should already be the most important part. That's just a disclaimer from me, but... You know, if you're going to be doing virtual production, you got to do pre-production. You got to know what the vision is. You got to communicate with the right people to help know what the vision is, how we're going to execute it, and be well prepared for when you show up on set. I have heard so many horror stories of people showing up to shoot on LED walls and then just something broke. Oh, two-hour reset, guys. We got to fix something on the technical side. Got to take a two-hour break. I've heard about people having to just literally postpone a shoot. The whole shoot had to get postponed like a week and stuff like that because things happen, right? And so the more you can prep, the better you will be prepared. Having your virtual worlds, uh, your virtual worlds need to be finalized before filming begins. Like literally, you've gotta have all your ducks in a row and make sure everything is not only designed but also optimized. Um, and you are always filming in one general direction. This is a weird one and it takes a while to get used to. But now you're filming this way. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, I need two people. I need two people. One, two. Let's do it. So come on up here. I'm going to show you what I mean. So I want you to stand right here. I want you to stand right here, right? Let's think about a shot reverse shot, right, in, uh, in typical films. Like you're always doing a dialogue scene between two people. Well, if I was on a, on a set, I'd be like, all right, shot reverse shot. Here's our 180 degree. We're going to stay on this side with the camera, right? So here's my over the shoulder. Let me pull up my camera. So there we go. Here's my over the shoulder. You're talking. You sound great. All right, so now we got our coverage of that one angle. You could have a multicam going if you wanted. Now, to get the other angle, I come this way, right? And now we're getting this over the shoulder. Boom, you got your coverage of the scene. Not on an LED wall. So now what we do is we obviously need to film this direction. So we would literally film this direction, get our angle, right? And then what we'd do, we'd move the camera over to here. You guys switch places, and we literally turn the world 
in 3D. And now, boom, now you're getting your other side of the, of the conversation. It's a whole new way to approach it. So you always have to be keeping in mind, thank you guys so much, give them a round of applause. So it's a whole new way to think about it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, limitation isn't the right word, it's just a new mindset, right? And that's something we, over the last, man, the last four months have really just been diving deep into like best practices and workflows and how to approach it and how to help under, other people understand it. Because when you get on set, you're gonna, no matter what, you're gonna have a typical way you do things. And we're like, oh, we're gonna have to rework this. Here's how we would, we recommend doing it. And that's why we wanna help people understand it. And we, as, as a facility, as Pronk, it's our job to kind of take all that stuff off of your shoulders, right? We're gonna be the ones to help you achieve your vision. You just come with the vision. We've got all the people that can help you know how to execute it properly, right? And that's our, that's our job, right? And so now I want to bring up uh, Will Stewart and I want him to kind of touch on uh, lighting a scene uh, on an LED wall, right? And so I'll let him kind of walk through that and then uh, we'll uh, uh, break into our Q&A after that. So Will, come on up. All right, so lighting a scene is super trippy. It's so weird. Uh, and there's a lot that uh, we just had to learn to figure out how to do. Um, we're students of this thing. And we've been doing it now nonstop for, for a few months that set it up uh, in February. And um, there's a lot you have to do. I come from a DP background, so DP director thinking about how do we how do we make this thing work? Uh, I got notes on my, I'm not texting, I promise. Um, so the first issue is the direct wash of light that, that light can, can do on here. And it does affect it. And it, you don't quite notice it at first. So the things you need to look for in the, in the monitor is how that milky blacks. And so you want to make sure that your black levels are actually true. If they're not, what you'll discover is your foreground objects are going to have that nice contrast that you're expecting and you're going to have. And then when you get into post, you'll see that your, your background is washed out a bit. Um, be looking at other LED uh, projects that things are filmed from LED wall, that's the number one giveaway um, when you when you look at it is is the background a little bit locked out. And sometimes it's hard to get around that. You can do some things in post. So DaVinci has a depth, a depth map feature, which is pretty cool now where you can create your background separate from your foreground. And so there's things you can do to kind of quickly fix maybe a, a slight issue. But um, as David used to say, fix it in post, we, we always say fix it in perfection. Um, so can can we turn off the, the LED wall real quick, just to show? Yep. This is a great way to just kind of, you can just see right there, I mean, there's the line of where, of how the, this, these lights themselves are, um, are you know, messing with the, the LED wall. Can y'all see that? See that, that big difference? It's just a huge contrast. I can turn it on. So, um, you know, these things are 100%. A lot of times our overhead lighting is not at 100%. We have the skirt a lot lower. There's a lot of things that, that happen to fix all that. So the way to get around that is, of course, bottomers, toppers, siders, uh, grids, and do as much as you can to just, just negate that. Um, another thing with lighting is that um, full spectrum lights, essential, or gels, having that kind of light that's, that's hitting uh, someone in the foreground it doesn't need to just be color balanced, all you know, daylight balanced uh, light. It needs to be that gross light that you get from from the environment. So, uh, are we doing the the, the the classroom scene? Yes. So, in the classroom scene, which we'll we'll have in just a little bit, there's like a brown cabinet that's that's um, that's coming from the camera right. There's uh, a floor. There's a ceiling. All that is colored. And if you don't think about okay, what's in my world, what's the color of the lights that are coming from it? It'll start feeling like um, the foreground is lit perfectly. And everybody's like, every, the skin tones are perfect. There's no, you know, color variance in the in the skin tones, but your background is completely um, looking natural. And so, um, it's funny how your eye will look at that and go, something's not right. You know, something's wrong. You don't quite know what it is, but it's it's all of that. Um, it's all of that lack of colored wash of just the world, just kind of light, kind of bouncing into a room. So. Um, I found that uh, you, in the studio, you don't need as many bright lights, right? You don't need think, you know, big old powerful lights, but you need more lights to just have these different washes and these different uh, colors that are coming at you. So I found that we are starting to use more and more lights, but they're, they're small and there's some really innovative things that are coming out now where you can, it's not that expensive to get some things that are colored that can, you can you know, color your world. So when you're approaching a scene, um, any kind of scene, the first thing I do is look at that 3D environment and see what is that 3D environment that we're filming in. 
and where are the lights and how are they, where are we, um, where's the motivated lighting coming from and is it lit how I want it? And the great thing about uh, all these Unreal environments is that you can do anything you want. And it's starting to spoil me. I'm starting to become a little bit of a diva because I can move the sun, you know, uh, trees, I can, you can affect uh, how the wind is, uh, how much of the wind is blowing and, and rustling in the, in the leaves. I mean, it's just amazing things. You can play God, you can just make it exactly how you want it to be. But it's important to be that picky uh, just to get it right. So we shot um, a kitchen scene yesterday and I asked David, I said, is this, I mean, the ceiling's kind of low. I don't like hitting the, I don't like seeing the ceiling in the frame. And I like kind of how the camera is. I don't really want to move that. Can we just make the ceiling higher? You, you know, five seconds later, like, boop, boop, done, you know? So that kind of thing is just wonderful. Um, and I really love it. So the first thing I do is I, I really look at that 3D environment. Um, when you're looking at any kind of uh, pre-production process and, and you're starting to see um, uh, high resolution stills that, that maybe your VFX team's giving you of the environment, it looks different in the LED wall than it does actually coming from the, the Unreal Engine itself. So that's something that we've discovered is that um, you need to throw it on a wall. And I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a limitation of Unreal environment. I don't know if it's like, there's still, you probably have a whole discourse you can put on, on why this happens. But there's just weird things happen, just odd things happen. So um, so like with the kitchen uh, the other day, we had, the, the, the floor was, um, oh, this is a beautiful wood floor, and if you look at it, you go like, this is perfect. But as the light was coming in, it was bouncing into the wood floor, and it was making the whole room just warm, and it's just not in a way that we didn't want. And so, um, I don't know if that's Unreal Engine overcompensating, I don't know if that's truly reality, and I just didn't realize it, but it just didn't look right. So we actually turned the, war, the, the, the floor black. We weren't gonna see it anyway, so we didn't need it to bounce light. So those kind of things are things you need to think about as you're you're popping up your scene on your on your LED wall. Um, expect those little quirks. Then I, once you figure out the light of the, for the 3D environment itself, then you want to think about lighting just the whole set. You, you think about your 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 world. A lot of times, what I try to get the uh, virtual team to do is flip the world for me. Let me see what what's on the other side of the camera. Yeah, even though we may not even see it, what what are the what are the wall colors? What are the things that are around there? And that starts giving my brain okay. This is the color temperature, temperature I want the room to be. These are the interesting things that might be hitting a scene and kind of splashing up to, into it. And all of that has to be reconstructed. So I, I start by lighting the, the set itself. And then you want to light the scene. Um, if you do scene first without the set, then it just starts again. It just goes back to that kind of un, um, uncomfortable, something's not looking quite right type, uh, type situation. Uh, so signs is not lit well. Things that I look for on, on monitor is um, not getting those color hits from, from the environment. So that's the first thing I look for. Um, things that are unnaturally contra uh, uh, contrasty. So in, especially in this situation, you know, we're kind of covered or surrounded by black neg, right? So it's like you have all those negatives. And, and so um, if things are just kind of like not right, not contrasty, a lot of times I'm taking a, uh, an ultra bounce and just bringing it in just to, just to make the light fly around more because this is not a natural environment that most you know, we're typically in when we're in the world. Um, another issue is when faces aren't lit by the room as well as the key. So when you have that, uh, like in a room, you're gonna get light from just kind of different, let's call it gross areas. Like you're just gonna get a wall that's, that's bouncing and, and light and that sort of thing. And if you're just lighting by your key, just saying I'm just gonna light with my key, it's just gonna look unnatural uh, to the face. And then, um, odd feelings, <laughs> I wrote a negative uh, feel off camera. So if you look at like a bowl or something that's reflective and you just see like a black strip or something uh, just showing the world, look for those kind of things you, and throw in a bounce of card or some, something just to give it a little something, keep it from being just that contrasty. And now when, when you see a, a scene with a, with a LED environment, start looking for those weird kind of contrasty things. Um, you see that also in car uh, environments. So if someone's filming in a car and they're in a uh, in a situation where they have uh, LED wall that's just you know uh, one sided. It's not a U shaped or circular circular shape. That's another issue that, that you'll see. You'll see the the car is very well lit on one side and then kind of contrasty on the other side. And so there's all kind of ways to kind of work around it. But those are things that that you need to work around it. Um, reflections are also important. So 
having reflections. There's a um, there's a stage in Hollywood that I was looking at that I, I'm, I'm totally envious. It's a U, it's, and all they do is cars. So it's, it's a U, a massive U, and then they have all these LED panels that are above with arms that you can like it can like retract, and come down from the ceiling, and then you can angle it just how you want it, and then you know, and then put it in. And I think that's amazing. And all they do is just film cars, film car scenes, and, and plates on it. Um, and reflections are so important. So uh, we recently filmed a uh, client had a, a, a vacuum cleaner that's a, a cylinder that's just it's completely reflective and it's a nightmare to film. But what we did was we put it close to the wall, got a lot of reflections that are wrapping around it and then took an 86 inch TV, brought it in and had that same scene. And then once we got all that in, got some ultra bounce in, got some cards in, it sold the, the effect and you're good. But just always just be looking for that. Do you want me to talk about anything like camera related, or do you want me to? Are we going to Q and A, and then we'll talk camera later? Yeah, we'll probably save camera for a second. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's my TED talk on lighting and safety. <laughs>